Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. My topic today is, how low can you go? That's an interesting question in this case. It's how low can you set the lighting wattages in the upcoming new energy code? And it's a very, very relevant question because the answer, if we can go lower, can save America millions and millions and millions of dollars every year. It can save even little old Hawaii some millions of dollars. And it decreases the heat load and makes everybody more comfortable. Very, very relevant question. <clears throat> My guest via Skype from the island of Maui is Stan Wolacek, one of the nation's foremost lighting efficiency experts. I'll introduce him formally in a minute. But first, let me pose this question. I'm with the State Energy Office, and we have as our Bible, our mantra, HCEI, the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. And that sets the goal of clean energy to produce electricity throughout the state by the year 2045, only 30 years from now. How in the world are we going to do it? Why is it a challenge? What's going on in Kaka'ako? High rises, high rises, high rises. I think there's going to be 20 of them going up in total, each one of them housing hundreds of living units, and those are not cheap living units. Those are going to be energy intensive. Plus, Ho'opili out on the Eva Plains just got finally, finally permitted 11,500 homes. And then on the heels of that, along H2, Castle and Cook has a massive, massive housing development that's been approved. On the Big Island, we have four or 5,000 new homes going up in the Waikaloa area. How can we cope with this? Oh, plus, the price of oil is going down. We all remember when it was well over $100 a barrel. It just closed yesterday at $34.50. Some of the nation's leading think tanks believe we may be looking at $20 a barrel. Why is that relevant? The cheaper oil is, the more people are going to use it. People are abandoning the march toward energy efficient vehicles, going back to SUVs because gas is cheap. All going against us. Plus, in every off <coughs> office that I go to these days, there are not one computer on the table. There are more like two computers on the tables. This is called plug load in office buildings. It's going up, 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 up. How in the world can we get to clean energy? Well, that's a subject for much, much discussion. We have technology just booming, booming. We have battery storage coming up. Hawaiian Electric is working on something called demand response, also working on something called time of use pricing. All of this is going to have revolutionary effects on how we use electricity. But what we're going to focus on today is lighting. You remember Moore's Law, Professor Moore, University of Pennsylvania, late 1960s, saw the nascent computer industry coming up and saw the improvements. And he said, this, com this technology is improving so rapidly that it is going to double in capacity and shrink by a factor of two every two years. When he saw what was really going on, he amended that to every 18 months. Just revolutionary stuff. A friend of mine has one of those Apple super duper watches and it said that in that watch there is more computing capacity than existed 
for the u s military during the korean war is that mind boggling or what well the lighting technology as we'll see in the course of this conversation is improving maybe not that rapidly but very 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 rapidly ten years from now will hardly recognize what lighting is all about and to emphasize this and discuss how low we can go in using wattage and still giving good vision is Stan Wolacek. Again, I'll introduce him formally. But first, let me set up our conversation here. This uh, Sachi is the new upcoming energy code for Hawaii, IECC. 2015. It will be coming to a county near you, hopefully in the next six months or so. And let me tell you what it says. The idea of the code is to reduce energy use in buildings as much as possible. And let me just read a few pages from this. The way we're going to achieve lighting efficiencies is, and I quote, these are different uh, section titles. Occupant sensor control function. Occupant sensor control function in warehouses. Time switch controls. Time switch control function. Light reduction controls. Manual controls. Daylight responsive controls. Daylight responsive control function. Side light daylight control. Top light daylight control. Daylight zone under roof fenestration assembly, specific application controls, exterior lighting controls, interior lighting power requirements, total connected lighting power, interior lighting power building area method, space by space method, additional interior lighting power, and then we have table. Maybe you can't see it at all, but these are different prescriptive lighting power requirements for different areas of the building. Or if you prefer a different method, here's more lighting control methods and targets to be achieved. And then finally, we have exterior lighting controls attached to the buildings and exterior lighting power. Now. Is that complicated enough or what? I am good friends with some of the best electrical engineers in the state of Hawaii, and they have called me trying to conform voluntarily to this code. And they said, Howard, here's what I'm trying to do. How do I do it? And if they can't figure it out, who can figure it out? Enter some of the and this is the problem that uh, Stan and I are going to be addressing, enter some of the nation's leading lighting efficiency experts writing in LDNA, Lighting Design and Application. This is the publication of the Illuminating Engineering Society. And let me read from some of what they are saying. Willard Warren, the energy advisor for Illuminating Engineering Society. As net zero energy era approaches, energy codes will require that ambient lighting be dimmable and controllable through the use of daylight harvesting sensor as well as occupancy sensor to shut lights off when there's no occupancy detected. That's what I was, those sections I was reading about. But, Warren says, with the use of more efficacious LEDs, they will be developed. The lighting power density will be so low that daylight harvesting and the use of anything more advanced than simple room lighting control can't be justified. And then he cites a fellow who used to spend a lot of time in Hawaii, Doug Avery. When Doug Avery was the lighting specialist for Southern California Edison, he surveyed a large number of advanced lighting control installations in the Los Angeles area. 
had discovered that about 90% of them were inoperative because there was no one on board skilled enough to maintain them. This is the peril of complexity. The editor of LDNA that I just showed you writes, the result of more controls is that it adds cost and complexity while saving less energy than it might. Plus, people find innovative ways to work around poorly written codes. And Stan and I will be discussing whether this is a poorly written code. It doesn't have to be this way. When we're looking at maximum installed wattages as an alternative to the type of controls that we were talking about. Finally, back to Willard Warren again, the energy advisor. He did a study. We found that daylight sensing prisms have been covered over by tape and learned that angry employees had convinced everyone that the prisms were connected to cameras to allow Big Brother to see if employees were being lazy on the job. And he talks about task lighting, which Stan and I will talk about. One watt of light from an LED task light located just above a desk, think desk lamps, is equal to 10 watts of ambient light from a luminaire in the ceiling. And finally, plug load all those computers and electronic gadgetry plugged into a building now, now exceeds the lighting load and consumes one watt per square foot and is growing. He concludes, it is becoming evident that with lighting load at or below 0 0.5 watts per square foot, advanced lighting controls centrally located cannot be cost justified. And I wonder where they got these ideas. I think maybe it was from Stan Wolacek because he has been writing papers like this for at least five or six years. In my prejudiced opinion, he came in first. Now, who in the world is Stan Wolacek? To introduce him, I have to read from a piece of paper because his accomplishments are so many. And again, he's coming to us from Maui. He has done over 500 projects, lighting projects and buildings, written over 100 white papers and published articles. He's conducted some 1,000 seminars, and he is the author of a book soon to be published by a technical body. Lighting and Controls, Transitioning to the Future. Without further ado, let me bring on the one and only Stan Wolacek from Maui. Welcome, Stan. Thank you very much, Howard, uh, for that. And I, before, um, if you can start the slides, please, Uri. We will wait for before the slides yeah, come up. It. I, um, oh, I, oh, I don't get to see the slides. Oh. Okay. okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, yeah, we're on the number three diminishing returns, Stan. Oh, okay, which is, which is very important. Before I continue, I want to mention most of my expertise is in the retrofit world. So most of this talk is going to be talking about that. But some of it also applies to new construction. So here's a table that I put together this weekend, and it's diminishing returns, and I hope you can read this okay, everybody. Yeah, it, it's readable, uh, Stan. Okay, great. And it shows over time, we're still saving 50 to 60%, sometimes even more, in wattage reduction, but the electrical bill reductions are getting smaller and smaller over time. For example, there used to be a lot of two by four troppers with four T12 lamps and two magnetic ballasts. 
144 watts, 1.8 watts per square foot. And a lot of times, and I'll talk about this later, that manual control can often be better than occupancy sensors for turning lights off, especially in what are called own spaces, private offices and elementary schools that the teacher stays in the classroom all day long or they have the energy cop kids. And often when occupancy sensors are installed, annual operating hours go up because people allow the 10 to 15 minute delay from the sensors instead of where they used to turn them off exactly when they left the room. Mm -hmm. So in this example, I have 3000 hours, which is very typical in a private office. An elementary school might only be 1500 hours. Mm -hmm. Other applications have much more than 3000 hours, but I just use 3000 hours. I use 25 cents per KWH, and you can see the original was $108 um, dollars a year per fixture. You're talking a hundred fixtures, you're talking some real money. And then let's say the first retrofit was done eight years ago, two high performance fluorescent T8s, a reflector and a standard ballast factor, energy efficient electronic ballast, 54 watts. The watts per square foot got down to 0.7, we saved 63%. Um, and basically we're saving $67 a year in electricity. Um, and, and we have less than a one year payback. Then a current retrofit using a 20 watt LED troffer kit. Um, also you, this can be done with good LED task lights. We're still saving 63%, but we've only saving $25 a year in electricity and it costs more with LEDs than with fluorescent. So we have a 5.5 year payback, which is good for some people and other people think it's too long. Mm -hmm. And then down the road in eight years, in an L an L a laser diodes might uh, replace LEDs in, in that time. And one reason LEDs, when you increase the drive current or the milliamps, the efficiency goes down. With laser diodes, you can increase the drive current and efficiency can go up. And so within five to 10 years, laser diode might be the foremost solid state lighting that we have. And again, we can go down to eight watts, save 60%, have very low power density, but we're only gonna be saving $9 a year in electricity. So we have over a 10 year payback. Mm -hmm. Again, these are some examples, but I think that you see the main, you know, the main thread of this, it's going to be harder to do a, um, cost effective lighting retrofits. And if you have to add occupancy sensors or advanced controls or daylight harvesting, often that's going to make the financial returns even worse than the 5.5 years or the 11.1 .1 years. Okay, yeah, Stan, yeah. We have to, we're going so rapidly that we have to take a break already. This is a classic example of diminishing returns. Let's take a break and be back in a minute. With Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important. And there's so many developments happening across the state. We hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. It's wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the islands uh, now and into the future, uh, energy clean energy, 
we need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So uh, come on down and, uh, and watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. Good afternoon again, Howard Wig. Think Tech Hawaii Code Green. My esteemed guest this afternoon is Stan Wallercheck. Lighting efficacy expert extraordinaire coming to us via Skype from his home on Maui. You know, we talked about the power or the lack of power of diminishing returns. Uh, one analogy that comes to mind is, say a car owner has a, a Prius that gets 55 miles to the gallon. Some friends of mine have cited that exact figure and they want to get more efficient so they can get a new car and it gets 65 miles to the gallon, yay! But they may be only spending three, four hundred dollars on gas a year because the, eff the efficiency is so good. Now they're going to save 16% of four hundred dollars. That's just doesn't make a whole lot of sense from, from a cost-effectiveness standpoint. And same here, when the more and more and more efficient you get, the less you consume, the less there is to save. When you uh, have that, I, I can think of another analogy, but uh, why, why don't we stand, just jump in here. We've got plenty more slides to go with your lighting retrofit swan song. Okay, one Slide thing here. about one thing about the cars i had a prius mm -hmm. and um i have pv on my house and th earlier this year i got an electric car mm -hmm. so instead of just making it more efficient on the gas side you know now i pay nothing for gas because i have enough on my pv so sometimes we're going to have to shift not just from gas but to a whole different technology mm -hmm. So let's go to lighting retrofits. So a swan song again. I, my yeah. focus is on lighting retrofits. Yeah, and, and it, the slide is up now, Stan. Yes. And so basically it's so important for lighting retrofitters, ESCOs, et cetera, to, and, and end customers to come up with good lighting retrofits, especially in the LED world, because, because if they're not good, end customers will probably be stuck with them for maybe 10 years because they won't be able to get the money or the approval to change them. Mm -hmm. So it's really important not to go like the T-LEDs and parabolic troffers. Mm -hmm. Have dark upper parts of the fixtures and you've kept the cave effect of parabolics mm -hmm. just to go with the cheap lighting retrofit with T-LEDs. Yep. And so we really have to look at this you know, down, you know, down the road, you know, maybe we should go with tunable lighting. Tunable means dimming and CCT or Kelvin changing for human centric lighting. Mm -hmm. We can't look at lighting anymore as a commodity, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And Stan, let me jump in and point out that the uh, turnover from New building, you know, demolishing old buildings, building new buildings is only about 1% maximum, 2% per year. So let's take that 2%. We won't have a turnover of all buildings for another 50 years. Therefore, if we're going to achieve some real savings across the board, we can't just be focusing on new construction. We have to be focusing also on, on retrofits. This is really, really crucial. And as you said, we need to do those retrofits right. Thank you. And we also cannot mandate controls or other things that are not cost effective. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, and I'll be referring to California Title 24 a little bit later. And with Howard's help, um, I'm very sure that a Y will not copy a lot of things that have not worked out in the, in the current Title 24 that was designed from people that typically love dimming and controls, but they didn't understand how efficient lighting would get even when a lot of retrofitters, including me, 
tried to educate them. They just wanted to go their ivory tower way. And, and let me jump in and say for our viewers that Title 24 refers to California's energy code. And California, if it were a nation, would be, I believe, the seventh largest economy in the world. And on a energy use per person basis, they traditionally have been number one in the country. They use something like almost just barely half of the per capita energy that, say, Texas uses. They are really, really, really progressive. They're a nation under themselves. They lead the US Department of Energy and the energy codes that we follow. But they are notorious for complexity. And Stan, you were one of the pioneers who pointed out that complexity in this case, as we're going down, 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 just ain't paying off. And in fact, it may jump back to uh, bite us in some ways. Thank you. So slide five. So again, as I mentioned before, human-centric lighting, and I'll give a website for this later. This includes the visual part and the non-visual or the biologic part of the visual system. You know, that maybe we really have to jump into this. So not only can we see properly, we can have good circadian rhythms. We can have alertness. We can improve productivity. Um, et cetera. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So now we can go to slide six, which is a table. So uh, yep, it's, it's up step. Okay, thank you. So this, this is basically for a private office that has two troffers. And so and, and let me jump in and say a troffer is that rectangular thing that you see up in the uh, ceiling it comes from the French troffer, which means ditch. Thank you. And so, you know, this is a private office that has two of these um, existing as 180 watts per pair or 90 watts per fixture, which is very common if you have three T8s and a, and a generic standard ballast factor electronic ballast. And we can retrofit each one of these with a 20 watt um, LED troffer kit or 40 watts per room. So we're saving 0.14 kW, 3,000 hours. And you know, we have the 25 cent kWh rate. And you can see on the far right, we have less than a three year payback. Mm -hmm. But let's then just do simple basic controls like a wall mounted occupancy sensor. With the wattage down so low, we're having a 17 year payback, which is really an infinite payback because the sensor might not last 17 years. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are pushing um, um, advanced controls. And you can see on the far right in the red that it's gonna be a 20 year payback. Again, that could be infinite because they may not last that long. So we really have to look at controls much different than we have in the past. And Stan, let me jump in for our audience again. When we're talking about payback, just, just as an instance, if we spend $100 on a lighting improvement and we save $20 a year, 20 times five, uh, $100. So that's a five-year payback. And generally a five-year payback when I'm helping to develop codes, and most people agree with me, we, anything above a five-year payback is kind of sketchy because technology is improving so rapidly that you, it's easy to achieve less than a five-year payback. So that would mean a good solid 20% return on investment per year. That, that's what this uh, payback business refers to. Thank you, Howard. And that's true with five years for owner-occupied but if people have leases in a tenant space mm -hmm. and they only have three years left or four years left yep. on their lease, they're gonna wanna pay back shorter than their lease time. And you have to really be careful what you offer them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see that time after time here in Honolulu, especially even small businesses. Small businesses tend to have short leases. Okay, so now uh, slide seven. 
So right now, lighting is usually more cost effective than control saving energy. So I often recommend with, if a customer has X amount of money, it's often better to do more lighting and no controls or more lighting and a little controls than lighting and a lot of controls, just the way that lighting is more cost effective. And I really wanna highlight, again, own spaces. And I've seen this numerous times in private offices and elementary classrooms, even where we did data loggers, showing the time that lights were left on after people left. And a lot of these spaces, and I highly recommend people doing data loggers, that um, people were so good turning the lights off manual almost every time they would leave. And when sensors were installed, they allowed the 10 to 15 minute automatic delay every time. And when you add maybe four or five of those per day, 365 days per year or 250 days per year, you're getting multiple hours. And again, this was proven um, in some school districts and some private offices you know, that I've worked on over, over time. So this is an example for new construction. You might want to mandate controls, but it should be separated and differentiated between new construction and retrofits. And if people are doing a great job turning lights off manually, there's no reason that sensors should be mandated. And this was a problem in California with Title 24. You're getting more energy, but customers have to pay for extra stuff, parts and labor, and there's no rebates for them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to be facing that same situation in Hawaii with no rebates when we adopt this new energy code. We need to take a break, but... First, two uh, clarifications. When Stan is referring to manual controls, he's referring to what most of us would call a light switch. And Stan, can you very uh, briefly describe what data loggers do before we uh, take the break? Okay, data loggers um, usually has a magnet and you can put them in the fixture housing and it, 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 it does what an occupancy sensor would do but it doesn't turn the lights off, but it will record over a one or two week period how much the lights are on when people are in and out of the space. Mm -hmm. Okay, on that cheery note, let's take another break. Think Tech Hawaii Code Green with Stan Wallercheck on Maui. Back in a moment. Hello everybody. I'm I.C. Davidson. Thanks for tuning in to Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, one of the things that we do here, or the thing that we do here, is promote civic engagement in Hawaii. What does that mean? We want to talk about things that people want to hear about. And we want you to engage us and be part of that conversation. One of the ways that you can do that is by joining in during our live show via Twitter. How do you do that? Well, you get on the interwebs and get Twitter, get an account, and mention us if you have a question. What you'll do is you tune into our show live, tweet us questions, and we'll, our hosts and guests will address them accordingly. It's really easy, it's really fun, and I think that your participation in what we're doing here will help us continue the dialogue on very important issues that we're trying to cover. Sustainability, clean energy, you name it, we're on top of it. We want you to be part of what we're doing because together we'll be able to make things change. Thank you for watching. Think Tech Hawaii, thinktechhawaii.com, weekdays, 12 to 5 p.m. That was weird. Good afternoon once more, Howard Wing, Code Green. Think Tech Hawaii, my guest is the Honorable Stan Wallercheck, who owns Lighting Wizards and is now headquartered on Maui. He's coming to us via Skype. The next slide that we're going to see after we've, Stan's been talking about the disadvantages of controls, he's actually going to point out that no, that controls actually have a whole lot of uh, benefits. So if we could bring that slide up, Stan, tell us why controls can be beneficial. And you've got a huge list here. The slide is up. 
Thank you, Howard. And I know um, we're, time is sort of getting shorter, so I'm yeah. going to go through this quickly. Um, one of the most, there's a number of things here that's really important. There are some occupancy sensors that can reduce airflow in a room in addition to turning the lights off. This is more for new construction and uh, because you have to have a motorized vent door. So this might be good like in a conference room that people come in and out of. Um, you can signal exact wattage and peak load. You can do cumulative hours. So if an LED system is rated for 50,000 hours, when it gets to be 40,000 hours, you could start to put money into a retrofit or new LED fixtures. There's a lot of forklift drivers that think they're NASCAR drivers that go very, very fast. And sometimes having a sensor on every high bay is not good enough for safety. And you need to have advanced controls. Improve security. Let's say it's an office building and you have advanced controls and they, they, they pop the lights on, you know, on room, you know, um, 913 floor, you know, the ninth floor, Sunday morning at 2 a.m., it could send a signal to security. It could even send a signal to police. You know, it could almost even lock the doors, you know, for that. And what's very important is master meter buildings that you have multiple tenants. A lot of times it's done with square footage, but if you have advanced controls, you could use it um, square footage with the burn time, you know, and have a better building for them. Also, various rooms are being used. Let's say there's an office building that wants more office space, but they don't know where to take it from. They could find out that people are not using these two conference rooms on one floor, and they could change it into offices. You could have interior GPS, just like outside when you're driving your car. You can have stores with digital addresses. Um, um, and then every lighting fixture would have the merchandise that's underneath. Target stores is doing this nationally as we speak. Measure carbon dioxide and humidity. And again, what might be the most important is, is dimming and changing Kelvin or color for human-centric lighting. Yeah, and very briefly, human-centric lighting refers to the fact that LEDs are so gosh darn flexible. You can control the dimming level, the light level, and you can control the color. You can create moods with human-centric lighting. And I think the first application for that will be in the retirement homes where people are indoors all day and you can mimic the rising of the sun in the morning, the setting of the sun in the afternoon, so in the evening, so that these people are in some way connected with the outdoors and this makes them healthier and happier. But we need to uh, move on. You've got more controls here and the slide nine is up now, what's that? And one reason that I really do, do not like mandating advanced controls, we don't know who the winners and losers are going to be for companies, platforms, protocols. And I've already seen this already happen. A lot of new companies only have initial funding for one to three years. And if they don't have big time sales or don't get bought up, they're going to go down the tubes probably. Mm -hmm. And some of these have private protocols that nobody else has. So if they go out of business, the end users will have to start from scratch. And I'm very concerned about this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just me. There's also Dr. Robert Karlasek at Rensselaer that also believes this. In two to five years, and the, the new lighting companies will probably be the Apples, the Cisco's, the Google's, and Qualcomm's of the world. Mm -hmm. They have billion dollar war chests. They know how to do smart chips. They know how to handle big data. And when they get into this, they'll be able to make sensors like you see in the photo of something fitting in a golf ball dimple for less than a dime. Wow. Each time of flight ones that will record how people are moving in the room. And these new sensors 
will be able to learn and adapt. So okay. instead of pushing it now and then having customers that get stuck with platforms or companies that have gone out of business, I would wait for a while for this industry to mature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a real look into the future, Stan. And unfortunately, we've got a grand total of perhaps three minutes. So we're going to have to sort of dash through the uh, okay. remaining slides here. Okay, the next slide is, you know, just like what Robert, I mean, Howard said, that um, task, um, that, uh, you know, that plug-in loads are overtaking ambient lighting. We really need to look at this. This is one thing that Title 24 did right. Every plug-in, half of them will be turned off with a, with a time clock and the rest will be on 24 hours. And the next one is, um, is, is slide 11. And again, in the lighting retrofit world, I don't think we need any energy costs. I think we have an evolved lighting retrofit industry and then customers that know what's going to be cost effective for them. And these are some of the things I don't have time with Title 24, with California Energy Commission did wrong, and even the new 15-day language is not good enough. So I feel very good what Howard will be able to do in the future. And then slide 12, Design Lights Consortium. This is an organization that approves products for rebates that Hawaii Energy will use. Um, and I think yeah, we don't need them either. Uh, they're slow, they will not approve anything over 5,000 Kelvin, even if that can be good for human-centric lighting. I think we just need LM79 reports um, instead. And then these are general reference, yes? Oh, uh, let, let me jump in and just say that LM79 is a testing procedure that was developed by the US Department of Energy. And that's the one that, uh, Use, uh, measures the uh, constancy of the light out, no, the, the light color. Isn't that it, Stan, LM79? It's, it's lumens, it's lumens per watt, it's distribution, yeah. it's R9, um, it's CRI, et cetera. Right. Okay. okay, and we're, we need to go to the references, and we are at the references now. Okay, so these are general references that are not mine, but I highly recommend you're reading all of these. These are all free, you can get on the web. And then here's my references. I wrote, a um, here's a Lighting Controls magazine article that's gonna be published um, early next year. Um, here's my book again. Um, and then I have two white papers, Task Ambient Lighting and How to Retrofit Troffers and Other Lineal Fluorescent Fixtures, that if you email me, I'll send you for free. And here's my phone number and my email address, you know, and my phone number and my last words. You know, I'd be very willing to present lighting seminars for Y Energy. If any of you would like that, please let your Y Energy reps know that and I'd be very willing to do it like I've done in the past. And that will do it for me, so thank you very much. And uh, let me close by saying that this program will be archived. It's usually archived uh, two or three hours right after the program. You just go to, if you want to make it real simple, Howard Wig, Code Green, and just like magic, boom, these programs appear, the wonders of electronics. So I hope that you have learned a whole heck of a lot. Moore's Law in action the lighting industry is improving so revolutionarily that we can decrease the cost of lighting design and drastically decrease the cost of the energy use of lighting in the very near future. And Stan Wallercheck for years has been the pioneer and he's keeping right on top of a very exciting topic. So with that, let me close Howard Wig. Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii, thank you very much, and thank you, Stan.